All right, great. Okay, so I'm here to present. Um, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it here and then. Okay. Here to present um, Bitcoin token. So you all showed up here because I promised a smart contract engine for, for Bitcoin. So now everybody's like sort of disappointed after sentence one, but you know, wait for it. I think it's actually pretty cool. So quick overview of what we're gonna talk about today is I'm gonna sort of review some existing work about like how people implement tokens in Bitcoin today, okay? Then I'm gonna like ask the question, you know, is there you know, anything wrong with this implementation? And like, if so, yes. And uh, you know, just the fact that I'm working on this means that I do think that something's wrong with how tokens are built. So I'm gonna propose some improvements here, and then at the end of the talk, there's gonna be a short, quick demo, okay? So jumping right in, so you're all extremely technical, so I'm, what's the most technical explanation for what a token is? You know, you can think of a token as just a jar of digital marbles, okay? You can own these marbles, you can trade them with your friends, you can send them to your friends, and then, you know, marbles come in all different sorts of shapes and sizes. You know, some of them are the same, like these white ones here, and it only depends on, like, how many of them you have. Other ones are all, all different, okay? So what's the like, slightly more technical explanation for what, what a token is? Okay, so let, let's forget about all decentralization and stuff and just think about how would you implement a token on just one machine. Okay, and, and in this case, it's actually pretty simple. All you do is just a database table, it's two columns. One contains sort of the IDs of the users and the other one contains sort of their balance and tokens, okay? And um, so in, in addition to this database table, we also have this, this integrity constraint. Okay, and, and so for example, in this, in this case of a, of a like fungible token where sort of balances are numbers, the integrity constraint would say that like the, the number of tokens in existence must remain constant throughout the operation of the, of the token, okay? So in order to prevent people to create tokens out of thin air. But then like I said, there's many different kinds of tokens, okay? And then in your, in your database implementation, you know, a different kind of token will and where all, all the marbles are distinguishable, okay? So if you wanna keep track of that in the database, you can't just use a number, you have to use like a, you know, a list of, of you know, names or identifiers for all these kinds of tokens. And, and of course, if I change sort of the, the database, the, the type of the, of the balance column, I also have to adjust my integrity constraint there a little bit, okay? So, so then the integrity constraint will say something like the, you know, the set of tokens that exists you know, remains the same you know, under all the, all the database updates. Okay, and then so this is just a data structure, but the question is also what can we do with tokens? And there's like three basic operations here. And so I can, I can issue a new token, I can send a token to a different user, and you know, specify a quantity there, and I can check the balance of Okay, so um, what's, the, uh, what's the sort of basic problem that we have to solve if we don't want to implement this on just one computer, but like now in a decentralized network where everybody, you know, you know they trust each other. So the, the, the big problem is that, you know, people might want to try to create, you know, tokens out of thin air, okay? So, so basically they're, they're spending one token, two out of them. The point of these tokens is, and, you know, if, if you can just sort of increase the supply indefinitely, your price is gonna to go to zero, so nothing has value there. So, so sort of to, to have, make sure that they have value, you have to ensure that tokens are not created out of thin air. And, um, so this sounds very similar to the double spending problem in Bitcoin, but it's a much, much, much simpler problem, okay? Because the, you know, Bitcoin had to solve this problem from scratch, whereas these token solutions can sort of make use of the distributed consensus provided by an underlying blockchain, okay? Um, okay, so now how, how are tokens built today? And so I'm gonna try to give a, you know, sort of a very general explanation for like most token standards work in Bitcoin today. There's many different competing standards and, um, but most of them actually rely on, the, on pretty much the same principles. So how, how could we do something like this in Bitcoin? So like I said, you have to do these three different things. You have to be able to issue a token and also be able to sort of securely receive a token and make sure that like nobody you know, scams you and, and stuff. Okay, so let's walk just through it. So to issue a token, what people usually do in Bitcoin is they just broadcast a, um, a transaction that's you know, you know, called the token issuance transaction and it must sort of comply with a, sort of a certain standard, okay? And then, then what people do is they, they just add into this Bitcoin transaction some metadata that, that contains important information about the coin, okay? So like in many examples, like your name there, you know, you can specify the supply and then usually you always have to specify which standard you're using because otherwise nobody knows what's going on pretty much, okay? And then there's many different ways you can add metadata um, to, to uh, Bitcoin transactions. Nowadays, everybody seems to converge towards using op return, 
I actually don't think that that's the best idea, but it doesn't matter. So, so broadly speaking, to issue a new token, you broadcast a transaction that has sort of metadata embedded there that describes the token. Okay, and then now to, to transfer a token from one user in an, to another, it's again actually pretty simple. All, you, all sort of that the sending user needs to do is broadcast a Bitcoin transaction that specifies how the tokens flow from input to output. Okay, and then like all of these different token standards have all defined different ways of you know, specifying these flows. And now for, the, sort of, for this talk, I've come up with another ad hoc um, way to do this, and you can see it there. Just to make this a little bit easier to read, what it, what it kind of says is like the inputs, sort of the first input contains green tokens and you know, 20, 20 green tokens, the, the second input 150 orange tokens, and the third input sort of consumes 50, um, um, 50 green tokens, okay? And then, then sort of the second line here specifies how they flow to the outputs, and I mean, you can all read, like all the green tokens go to Alice in the first output, and all the orange tokens go to, to Dave in, in the second output. Um, okay, so the hard part about building tokens is, is securely um, accepting tokens. This is, this is the, the point where you sort of have to check this integrity constraint and make sure that the token that you're receiving is actually a valid token according to the standard. And there's, you know, different, different ways to do this, and there's basically two, two basic approaches there. Um, the first is have all the Bitcoin miners sort of, you know, ensure that, like, no, tokens don't get created out of thin air. Again, so, so there's been this proposal called OP Group that has been discussed in, in Bitcoin Cash, and it, it's, it's a new opcode for the Bitcoin scripting language that will specify exactly how tokens flow from inputs to outputs. But since, um, um, you know, I mean, this is something that doesn't exist in Bitcoin right now, and so, so the way to do it in Bitcoin as it exists currently is the, the idea is just like if, if I get sent a token, you know, it's my responsibility to, to check that I don't get scammed, okay? And the nice thing is that you can actually do this in Bitcoin. So, so in this approach taken by, for example, Colored Coins and Omni, and actually more, you know, pretty much all, um, all tokens that are currently in, existing. Okay, so let's look into this a little bit more detail. Accept the token, what do I need to do? I need to monitor the blockchain and, um, you know, to, to, to sort of uh, notice when, when I get a new token that I can spend, okay? So in, in this example that I'm doing here, so I'm, I found this, this unspent output on the blockchain, um, and it says down there, Clemens gets two tokens, so, so this is like a token that I can spend, so I'm very interested in this token, but I still have to make sure that I'm not, not getting scammed here, okay? And sort of to, um, to, to check that this is sort of a valid token, I need to find all the upstream token transitions that sort of are, are pretty much sort of the history of, of this token, okay? Every time this token has changed hands, I must make sure that everything was fine. So what I do is I, you know, Query the blockchain and I find all upstream Bitcoin transactions, sort of all, all, all the sort of token bearing ones, and um, until I finally hit sort of the, the token issuance transaction, okay, that I explained in, in step number one. Okay, and then once, once I've sort of completed step number, number two here, I need to sort of now I can start to check whether this is a valid token or not. Okay, and, and what's, what a valid token is, is what is mostly specified in these token standards, okay? So now if you look at a, at a you know, token standard, they all pretty much have the same form. You know, they always you know, start with an intro, just like every document, and then you know, sort of followed by a series of definitions. The first one's usually sort of the definition of, of you know, what's a valid sort of issuance transaction that just specifies you know, all the forms and the encodings that need to be there. Then if this is like a, you know, you know, some, some, some token standard that supports minting new tokens, then there's also a definition of you know, what's a valid minting transaction. And then usually what follows is like this, this sort of list, lengthy list of, um, of you know, different kinds of token transfers that this, this standard supports, okay? So let's just walk through this example, what we do here. So I found all, my, all the relevant transactions on the, um, on the Bitcoin blockchain. So I start now verifying top down. So first I compare the issuance transaction up there with the issuance transaction definition in the token standard, okay? And you know, if, if you know, sort of it values to true, if, it, if that validates, I say, okay, issuance was done correctly, that's fine. Now I have to look at all the token transfer transactions that are down here, always compare them with the token transfer definition and see that they all check out, okay? And so in this example, let's just see that you know, they all check out and I have to do it top down like this because sort of the, the validity of a token is always kind of progressively defined in terms of the validity of all its ancestors, right? So a token's valid if like, you know, that one transfer is okay and all previous ones were okay as well. Okay, so, so let's see what happens if, if someone cheats. 
Okay, so I make an example here. We're here, sort of Carol broadcasts a transaction, creates 51 tokens out of 50 tokens. Okay, and, and that's exactly the, the case that we wanted to, to prevent, and that's exactly what sort of this transfer definition will, will tell you not to do. Okay, so, so now if I, I find this invalid transaction, what usually happens is it invalids all sort of downstream transactions. Okay, so as soon as I found this bad token transfer, I can mark all, or all downstream token transfers as invalid. But what's actually important here is that like, you know, this, this guy, this red guy there, sort of got invalidated, and everything downstream from that transaction, like starting from the point where someone cheated, everything gets invalidated. But the other users, you know, Bob here, you know, still happy with, uh, with his transfer. He can still spend these 150 tokens somewhere else because he didn't cheat and nobody in his history has cheated. Okay, so, okay, so what's wrong with this? Actually, this looks kind of cool in my opinion, but um, also in my opinion, something must be wrong, okay? And so why must something be wrong? So you just look at the history of tokens. So tokens got invented in Bitcoin, on Bitcoin in 2012, okay, that's a long time ago, and, and tokens like this, you know, MasterCoin and, and, and you know, now called Omni and whatnot, have been operational for a long time and, you know, securely without bugs, so it can't be that bad, okay, but then what happened in, you know, 2015, Ethereum gets released, okay, and now the, the ICO craze, you know, kicks off, and everybody launches token all the time, but everybody uses Ethereum. So what happened here, you know, Bitcoin had like a head start of three years, but still Ethereum sort of, you know, just, just won over the whole field. So, so there, there must be a better way to, to build tokens on Bitcoin, okay? So, so, and then like this is just now my opinion, what, what might be wrong here. Um, so there's different things. So first of all, I'm not a big fan of this use of the, the up return statement. Um, it's just, I will talk about this in detail. It's, it's a complicated way to encode things and there's a much more natural way to use Bitcoin transaction than what's there already to encode stuff more, more nicely. But that's, that's kind of my, my weakest argument a little bit. Okay. My, 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 my strongest point why I think this, this stuff is wrong is because all these token standards are sort of can express only like, you know, a very small number of smart contracts. Okay. And these smart contracts are usually hard coded in the standard. I'll, I'll tell you more about that. And so, so every single token standard that has been proposed in Bitcoin today sort of supports less than 20 smart contracts, okay? Whereas you have Ethereum, which supports an infinite number of smart contracts, okay? And, you know, that's kind of cooler. And um, so that's my second point. And the third point is there's, I think, a big scalability issue with the way we build tokens. This gets brushed aside a little bit, but I think in practice, in certain applications, it's going to be a big problem. Okay, so let me just walk you through these three points in detail here a little bit. Okay, my, my problem with up return is that um, people sort of, sort of have to encode th this token flow in the op return statement, but the information that you find there is absolutely worthless if you don't have access to the standard, okay? And so I've actually been kind of nice here and picked like a sort of a readable format here, but in, in reality, the people who do find the tokens, their goal was to squeeze the maximum amount of information into the minimal amount of bits. And so that's, you know, that's how um, sort of token transfer instructions look, and I think this is actually copied from the, from the colored points protocol, right? And so, so now you're asking the programmer to, to kind of use this programming language. And I, I just don't think that's, that's the right way to do it. And yes, please. Um, it's okay to ask yes, yes, please, everybody. Yeah. Um, so in this off return specification for coins, it's not the case that the definition contains like the data structure of off returns and parse it. It's yeah, I mean, so, so, so the, the, yeah, you, you kind of, you, you do parse this and it will, it will get parsed into something like this. But it's not part of the like, issuance uh, definition. It's not part of the issuance transition. Did you look at my slides in advance? No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, no, a, a very good comment. And, and so, so to understand what this means, you really have to look at, you, you can't find this information on the blockchain, okay? So you have to find the standards document. And like the blockchain archaeologists a thousand years from now will find this information in, in the blockchain and have no idea what it means just because it's worse, it's information. And like, I don't understand, like the goal was to save space on the blockchain and really we're, we're putting this information there that nobody can ever read. So to me, that's, that's also just a way of, of, of wasting space. So the way that I do this is I just encode my metadata in, in the output scripts themselves. And it's very easy to do this. You, you know, you take your standard output script and you just push data to the stack and pop it off immediately afterwards. So the miners don't even know this. You just push something in and you pop it off immediately afterwards. But but the, the difference is we don't have to assign meaning to the data that's there, okay? The, the sort of the meaning arises from how it works, yeah? So, so how, how does this work, 
Okay, so now, now we find this transaction on the blockchain, we see there's just the words green and 70 here and orange and 150 here. Okay, but we also know that someone signed these transactions and broadcast them to the blockchain. Okay, so Alice, Bob and Carol all signed these messages. Okay, so, so you know, there's lots of you know, talk about how do we get data into the blockchain. No, this is a way to get data into the blockchain. I produce an output, I sign it, and then everybody knows by the functionality that I signed the statement. If I make a statement, this guy's an idiot, I sign it, everybody is gonna know that I said it and when I said it. And I don't need like a separate standard document that explains that to me, because it just sort of arises from how Bitcoin works. I think that's a better way to do it. And then, you know, what, what do these outputs mean? Okay, so the, the outputs, you know, officially the UTXO set of Bitcoin is, is sort of the, the mutable state of the blockchain. Okay, that's, that's sort of the, the current state of the blockchain that can be updated. All the spent outputs is the log of everything that happened in the past. Okay, so but a UTXO is always like, it just means you're part of the current state. Okay, so if I find this output, I know now that, um, you know, green 70 is part of, of the, of the um, current state and Alice, Bob and Carol thought it's important to write this down today. Okay, but, but then what does it mean that Alice can, can spend that output? It means that sort of Alice sort of can update that data. Okay, so that's like a notion of data ownership. Alice kind of knows this data now and Alice is in charge of, is, is allowed to update it. Okay, so I'm saying just by encoding data in the transactions themselves, there's sort of lots of semantics attached there that we don't have to specify in, in separate documents, it just arises from how it works. I think that's just a better, cleaner way to do it. Okay, and, and of course everything that I can do here can be encoded in an op return output, but, but and, and that's absolutely true, but that's just like saying, okay, we can just use JavaScript and as variable names, we're only gonna use uh, numbers. Okay, you can program everything like that. It's just horrible to program that way. And if you wanna look at Bitcoin like a programming language, you know, I think it's important that we sort of include data as cleanly as we can. Okay, but that's, that's my, my least strongest point. So my biggest issue is, is currently this thing, just, just these standards. And it partially has to do with the fact that like preparing for this talk and I had to read all these standards and it's, it's not fun. You know, they're, they're very, very long, Omni Protocol is 100 pages, and they're just not meant for human uh, consumption, okay? They're, and it's not, it's not that they're badly written or that the authors are stupid, that's not at all the case, they're very smart. But it's just like the, 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 the content that you wanna write down, is just not suited for human cons consumption. So you read this document and it says, you know, byte number three means this and has to be one if this is the case. Like this, nobody can read this stuff, okay? And it's just very, very complicated. Okay, so, so number one is it's, it's very hard to read and being hard to read just means very few, few people will read it. So I, I'm gonna assume that, that like, I think at most a handful of people have read the entire Omni specification, okay? And so, so if very few people read your standards document, you know, it's very unlikely that they will find, you know, little bugs in there, okay? So it really makes everything less secure, okay? And the second problem is also it's hard to implement. So in my opinion, there's no harsher punishment for a programmer than having to re-implement one of these standards because you're gonna spend like months sitting there parsing every single line in this, in this text-written document and turning it into code. That's just something horrible to do. And there's no way that if someone does this for 100 pages, they're not gonna make one little mistake. Okay, so I'm sh you know, I would bet that you know, none of the Omni implementation, I, I don't wanna like harp on Omni too much, okay? This is the case for all, all of the other ones as well, okay? I'm sure that they all, are not 100% sort of standards compliant. And then you have two different, the only reason you have a standard is you wanna have multiple implementations. Now you have two different implementations with two different kinds of bugs, and then bad things really happen. So I, I don't think that's good at all. And, and sort of the, the, the most important thing here is that there is, in, in this general approach that everybody's using today, there is this inherent trade-off between simplicity and expressivity, okay? And let me tell you what I mean by this, okay? So think of the space of all tokens. Okay, I told you in the beginning, a token is a database table with an integrity constraint, okay? So when I mean all tokens, I mean all database tables with all conceivable sort of integrity constraints. That's an extremely large class of smart contracts pretty much, okay? And then if we, if we look at, you know, what, what these transfer definitions really mean, these transfer definitions really map to sort of like one specific token, okay? You have one transfer definition for a fungible token, that's like the ERC-20 token, uh, ERC-20 token contract in Ethereum. You have, you know, one for non-fungible tokens. So each of these, these little transfer definitions really correspond to, you know, one token, one dot on my infinite pane of all tokens, okay? So, so now everybody sets out to build a better token um, contract, okay? So, you know, two directions you can go. Okay, either you say, we're gonna do, uh, you know, the simplest, you know, possible standard, and, but really what they're just doing is they're, they're taking away these transferred 
transfer definitions. Okay. Just to give you a feel for this, Omni contains, I think, 13 transfer definitions, and then there's another 13 of them that are, or like more or less, um, that are sort of proposed for the future. Okay, so if I wanna get my, I have a new idea for a token, I have to get in, back in line after, you know, 13 other people that have to be implemented before me. That's, you know, that's just, just never gonna work. Okay, so, but then there's sort of the other side where you say, okay, we're gonna make a very simple um, um, standard, one that people actually, you know, read and where they will find bugs and where, you know, implementations can be made that are compliant, but sort of that comes at the cost of, of just reducing the stuff that you can express even more, okay? So you're, you're sort of now, now we're only supporting one smart contract, okay? I have, maybe I have the shortest, you know, standards definition, but I, I can only do one smart contract, that, so that can be awesome. And then sort of the other approach is, you know, we, we keep adding more transfer definitions here, and, and you know, what, what happens is we add like this little dot, you know, we can cover one more little smart contract in this infinite class of smart contracts, and then, you know, we, we, we can't cover, the, this is not gonna work, okay? We can't cover everything that way. Okay, so, so just to, to do this a little more, here's like the business school side of this. We have simplicity on the x-axis, expressivity on the y-axis, some standards, I'm not gonna name names, are y, neither simple nor simple, uh, nor, neither simple nor expressive, we're about those, we have a bunch of them that are, you know, very simple, but only support very few use cases. And then we have sort of, these are actually, in my opinion, the best ones right now. Those that are, you know, very, very complicated to read and to use and to implement, you know, and then they can express, you know, a handful of smart contracts at least. So that's actually better. But, you know, can, can we get, you know, any better than this? Yeah? And I think we can. And the reason I believe this is because we have Ethereum. Okay? Ethereum, if you want to learn it, it's actually quite simple. Okay? And it's also fun because you're learning a programming language, but Ethereum really only consists of like 10 constructs that you have to understand really. Okay, it's quite simple to understand. So I'm gonna say Ethereum is like as easy to learn as like all of these existing token standards, but it's like way, way, way more, more expressive, okay? And actually like Ethereum, you know, I'm being pretty kind to our token standard here. Ethereum is way off the, off the chart because like infinite number of, you know, smart contracts. These are like 13, okay? So there's a big difference in expressiveness between Bitcoin token. To to so what I'm gonna try and do is create a Bitcoin token standard that's like, you know, very simple, like the simple ones, but also much more expressive, okay? And so, so actually what I don't know is like how, how the expressiveness of my thing currently compares to Ethereum, but we can do like an infinite class of smart contracts, we can do many different things here, okay? So, um, okay, and I also wanted to talk about like scalability concerns, yeah? Um, Okay, my scalability concerns are about like, and this actually gets brushed over in many of, the, many of these token definitions. They're like, okay, yeah, like most, most cases we can build a light client, it's just gonna work. And, but, but here's the bad thing that can happen, okay? I find this, this you know, token transfer definition where I can you know, spend the token, okay? And so I, I do my recursive thing and I, I find all the ancestors, I find two answers, that's fine. They have four ancestors, okay? And, that, and that's just like if, if these tr transactions have have like sort of two incoming edges, sort of two inputs, okay? I get like an ex exponential explosion in the number of work that I have to do, okay? And you know, that's just never gonna fly. And so I talked to a friend of mine at, at, at Google about this and he, he was immediately like, we have to work with this, okay? There's no way this can work in practice if we have like exponential runtime in the age of a token. That's insane, okay? And it, it really like all, your entire fungibility goes completely out of, out of the window. You know, you get one token, check three transactions, you're fine, you got it. You know, you know, get the next token. You have to verify stuff for three hours, okay? And I think this, this actually works in applications, in B2B applications where you care about throughput more than, than latency because, and this is probably why we know um, Tether works. Um, but in, in consumer-facing applications, you know, you care about latency, okay? If, you, if you're doing a game and someone's trading with you, you don't want, want like, to wait an hour to get your sword or something like this, okay? So, so I think this is a big problem. Okay, so now that I've like, uh, um, complained about existing standards. Let's see, you know, if I can, I can, you know, contribute something here. And I, I also don't want to, want to sound like too negative here. I, I actually think like the invention of tokens on Bitcoin is amazing, and the fact that it happened in 2012 is is incredible. And it's like very brave and smart people did this kind of stuff. But now, you know, it's six years later, so we should be able to improve on this kind of stuff. Okay. So first of all, yeah, I don't want to play this game. Okay, I'm not going to start. Even like I'm the guy who had to write this standard. I, I. I I would refuse to write 100 pages of boring stuff. That's, that's like, I don't want to spend my life with like this. Okay, what I want to do is be lazy, not write a long standard, and cover all, all uh, possible tokens. Okay, so how do we do this? So first of all, I've argued, so this thing 
you know, I'm just going to remove this from the, from the standard that's in my mind that I haven't even written yet. And then, so you now this minting tra transaction definition, you know, in a sense, that's also just like, you can think of it as like just a special token transfer definition. It's just one with a different integrity constraint. It's just one where you can, you know, create tokens out of thin air. That's what minting does. Okay, then I'm, I'm going to say it's pretty much the same thing. So I'm also going to remove, remove this. Okay, but then, so th the question is, how do we come to a token standard that covers this all? Okay, so one approach is having an infinite length token standard. It's unpractical. Um, but, but really what we need to do is, at the end of the day, for every single point in my infinite pane here, in this orange thing, um, we're going to need one, one transfer definition. Okay? And sort of the approach that I take here is, I just, I just trust the programmer more. Yeah? I give the programmer more, more power. I don't tell them how to specify stuff in detail. I, I let them give it to me. Okay? So in, in my token standard, I, I have a parameterizable token standard. Okay? And if you want to use my token standard, you know, you can use this and all this, you know, finding all the, you know, previous transactions on blockchain is going to work just like before, but you get to decide what's your definition of a valid, you know, token transfer definition, okay? And since, since like, you know, for every dot there is one transfer definition, I can, you know, you know, plug in for every dot, I can plug in the transfer definition in my standard and, like, cover that dot, okay? So just by this simple trick of, of having the token standard be parameterizable by the definition of the token transfer transaction, I can cover all possible tokens, which is an insanely large class of smart contract, and it's unclear whether it's, you know, you know equal or less to, to Ethereum, okay? And then, okay, the next question is, okay, so the programmer provides um, sort of, I mean, who, who sort of provides this, um, this token transfer definition? And, you know, I think it should be the guy who issues the token, okay? So you issue a token, you make up your mind which transfers do I allow, and sort of you write your definition here, okay? And so now I've said that like any user can write their token transfer definitions, and I've also complained that like the the, um, the sort of the, all these tokens are very hard to write. Now I'm sort of proposing that we, we have a standard where you know 100 different people write 100 different definitions. And that's going to be even harder to, to sort of to, to to read and understand. Okay, so maybe we should have like some sort of formal language here. Okay, and so so I propose that we use weak weak um, monadic second order logic with the unbounding quantifier. And so, so you're all engineers, I'm sure you're all familiar with this stuff, so you know, r raise your hand if you've heard of this stuff. Okay, that's a bad joke. Of course, we're not going to do that. What we're going to do is we're going to specify them in JavaScript. Okay? So everybody knows JavaScript. And, and essentially what I'm proposing is, you know, write smart contracts for Bitcoin in JavaScript. Everybody knows and loves JavaScript, okay? And it doesn't have to be JavaScript. It can be any programming language. Okay? The you know, standard is very generic. Okay? Then, okay, so how, how do we define transfers, you know, you know, you know Bitcoin transfers in, in JavaScript, okay? So let's, let's look at this example of the ERC-20 token, okay? What you have to do is you have to implement in JavaScript a function that inputs the JSON representation of the transaction and outputs a Boolean. That's it. That's all that the standard says, okay? Plug in your definition here. It has to be a function that inputs a JSON representation of a of a transaction outputs a boolean. I don't care about the rest. Okay, you can plug in there whatever you want. Okay, so let me show you a few examples. So, so okay, to be precise, we're, we're plugging in the, you know, the, the transaction and the UTXOs that it's currently spending because you need to know that to, to, to validate the thing. Okay, how, how do we do this? I mean, we just write a simple function that, you know, we, we got this JSON representation of the UTXOs here that just, you know, parses this document and finds the right data and then sums it up. So you compute the sum of tokens that are sort of consumed by the inputs. Okay. And then you write, you know, a very similar function. We just iterate the outputs of, of, the, of the transaction that you got input, okay? And you compute the number of tokens that are, that are sort of created. And, um, and you just return, you have to return a Boolean. You just return that these are the same numbers, or, you know, one should be smaller than the other, whatever, okay? So, so it's a, this is a very, very simple way to, to define an ERC-20, you know, token in, in Bitcoin, okay? And then, of course, you have to implement your some inputs function, some tokens function normally here, okay? I'm just going to leave this as point, point, point. And then, so is there any, any questions at this point, maybe? Please. Sure. Um, don't you think, actually, it's, it's kind of problematic to actually write a smart contract in JavaScript? Because actually, you would, in, you would basically introduce more bugs. Because I feel like Solidity, there's, there's a reason why it's, it, it is as it is, because it's a domain specific language. Because now you actually have all the other bugs that can actually add a package with JavaScript itself as a language. Yeah, so I agree. Um, 
I think JavaScript today can be made better than it was. So, so all the code that I'm writing is always like statically type, type check this flow, and and you know I'm using like this this super harsh linter by Airbnb. And you can actually get around many of the gotchas that JavaScript used to have. So JavaScript today, I'm saying, is better than you know ten years ago. But still, if, if there there are still weird corner cases that you know people might fall into, and um, if they don't want to use JavaScript, they can use any other program that they like. Absolutely. Okay. What okay, well, my point is that actually, so for so for uh, like uh, for an, for an experienced developer like yourself, you could use like TypeScript and Flow and like type, type check JavaScript and yep. do certain things and really avoid some corner cases, right? But then we have like more web developers coming through the coming on the scene. They want they want to write like uh, smart contracts, but they don't have the best practices, right? When it comes to writing like secure code. Yeah. And I think it is actually they're the ones we need to make worry about. Yeah, no, I agree with that, but 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 still, I think actually learning flow is 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 not as hard as as it seems. Okay, and like these smart contracts, you know, many of them will be quite short, so you can get you know some quite some some way with JavaScript and flow. But then you know if it's so, this is also just step one. Okay, eventually I want to like create you know a better smart contract language that will be you know much much you know much fewer corner cases to worry about. But like in step one, you know this is this is sort of for me. I'm, I'm working on this for four months now. This is sort of the the fastest way for me to to make progress is, okay, right now we'll write these contracts in, in JavaScript, and, and you know, eventually we'll, we'll, we might move on to a different language. Yeah. I'm confused, what, what are the contracts compiled to? They compile to nothing? They run. Yeah, so, so I mean, what, what happens is, so, so I'm, I'm doing sort of the smart uh, uh, token fund um, standard and the reference implementation, okay? So and then I'm going back to this thing here. Okay. Well, actually, I should have on the other side. So, so, so this, this is all. No, 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 no. It's totally fine. Yeah. So, so, so this, this is all sort of taken care of by the reference implementation. Okay. The reference implementation go ahead and like download all these, all these little things. But then when you go down, you know, when you check these transactions, you just run that JavaScript. You know, I, I, I you know, I find that 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 definition, and I just run. You know, whatever function you give me, I run, and I, I'm going to say, you know, it's you know, checks out if it values is true, and it doesn't check out if it values. Yeah. So you're building a runtime. Um, yeah, I think that's what a runtime is. Then. Yeah. 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 All right. So actually, I, I have also slides about what we just talked about. Um, okay. Where were we? This token definition runs off chain. I think that's what you just maybe. Uh, no, well, everything, all these, these, these token definitions usually, most of them work on chain, where sort of if you want to, like, you know, send a token to another person, you broadcast the, 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 the transactions to the blockchain. And all these trees that are shown here, these trees, are, these are all transactions that are, like, committed to the blockchain. Uh, the, the verification. Okay, so I had this thing, and, you know, that, this is my parameter, was standard issue, plugs it in. Okay, and then we talked about the fact that we're gonna, not going to do it in this stuff. We're going to use, use JavaScript. We get these examples here. Okay, so ERC20 token, I think we did. And like this is, you know, ERC721 token. This is like the, the non-fungible token standard. This was used for, for the crypto kitties, I, I think. Okay, and you know, the, your function is a little bit longer, but it's, it's actually not much more complicated. Okay, all you have to do is, you know, you have to like deal with sets and set equality and just disjointness and stuff. It's, it's still, you know, pretty, pretty easy sort of to write these kind of things, okay? And then if you want to sort of, I mean, my opinion is like we haven't yet discovered, you know, the killer application for smart contracts, okay? So the contracts, smart contracts that will be developed in the next 20 years will be way more awesome than everything we have right now, okay? And so you can just, you know, if you're the person to invent that smart contract, you know, congratulations, you're now rich, and you can just very easily sort of encode it in this thing, okay? And you can put as complex code in there as you like, as simple code in there as you like, whatever you want to do. Okay, and the next question is like, where do we store these transfer definitions? Okay, and you think, okay, so maybe we use a web server. Okay, and then, but, you know, web server the problem is, okay, so, so now some, some bad guy issues a new ERC20 token. It's like, you know, the, the well understood program that everybody knows and stores it on the web server and um, launches the token, raises $50 million in three days. And after three days, he changes the web server to say, okay, ERC20 token is okay, but you know, another transfer that's okay is send everything to me and just scams everybody. Okay, so, so we, we can't store these smart contracts on, on a you know, sort of mutable device like a web server because it's entirely insecure, okay? We, we need to store it in some place that, that we're guaranteed that it never changes, okay? And um, that it never changes and that, um, 
and, and, and that's, we can always find it at, at, at the same place. Okay, so, so does anybody know a storage device with these properties? What? I know, but I think you said it. Blockchain, that's it, okay? We're gonna store it on the blockchain. Yeah, that's what Ethereum does. Okay, they store their smart contracts on the blockchain. We're store, or store our, you know, JavaScript, Go, whatever you want. No, smart contracts on the blockchain, okay? And more, more specifically in the issuance transaction. Okay, and now, now I have to coming back to your question here. Um, how, 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 how this all kind of fits together a little bit, okay? I have my parameterizable token standard, and I don't know anything about this token, okay? All that happens is I find this transaction where I get 100, 100 tokens, okay? So I, I don't know anything else. But, but so now I use sort of the, the, my reference implementation, or I do it by hands. I find all my upstream transactions, okay? And there in the issuance transaction, I find my transfer transaction definition, okay? Just a little bit of JavaScript code, okay? And then when I first, other, other than that, everything works just like in, in the previous token standards, okay? So I, I still sort of, I find in, in my issuance transaction, the standard we're using is the you know, Bitcoin token standard. So I find the Bitcoin tokens and I check, you know, this issuance transaction definition. And, you know, in this example, I'm gonna say it checks out, okay? But then if I have to sort of validate these downstream transactions, I always validate them against a sort of transfer definition that's stored in the, in the original um, output, um, in the output of the issuance transaction, okay? And so, so this is how I can sort of accept, you know, tokens using the simple token standard, okay? And, okay, so that, that was sort of my, my, my attack to give us more, more um, um, expressivity. And like I said, it's, it's you know, can sort of, um, it's, it's very, very expressive. So, I, I, and, and in fact, like all, every existing token standard on, on, on Bitcoin, um, you know, can be implemented in this thing. And so if you're working on your token implementation, you're lazy, right, that JavaScript function use my code, and, and you're gonna be done quickly, okay? And okay, so now, now back to the scalability problem. So I talked about it like, you know, scalability, like issuing a token is super quick, okay? All I do is I build a transaction, send it to the blockchain, and I'm gonna say it's constant time. Sending a token super quick, I just build a transaction, broadcast to the blockchain, done. Receiving a token, we have this horrible runtime, exponential in the token age, and so I talked about why this is really, really horrible, okay? But then sort of the first idea here is, you know, you could call it just like, you know, don't be an idiot or, you know, more technically use memorization, and it just means, like, you know, store stuff that you've looked at, okay? Once you, if you trust yourself, you know, you've validated yesterday that, you know, this is a valid, you know, um, um, transfer transaction, and, and you know that, you know, Bitcoin's immutable, it can't change if there's enough confirmation and stuff, um, you don't have to check that again, okay? So the idea is every time you, you check that, like, some, some transaction's valid, you store that in your database. And, and actually, you don't have to store the entire database, you only have to store the very, very short and transaction ID, okay? So, and like the advantages, this, this is very cool. So, so now I find this new token here. And so instead of having sort of to revalidate all this, all this potentially exponentially large thing, I, I just look into my database, okay? So that's really quickly. And um, maybe I'm even lucky and sort of the other thing also just have, has like this, this short history and I can accept tokens really, really efficiently. But, um, unfortunately, you know, this is not, no guarantee at all. Okay, so this does nothing for worst case complexity. If I'm just unlucky, I'm keep, I keep hitting these, these really, really expensive things. Okay, and then, and this, this is where, where this, this thing about like, you know, um, latency versus, um, versus throughputs comes into play. So probably like on average, it's relatively, you know, on average it might work, and that's maybe why Tether works. But like if you're interested in, 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 in latency and worst case performance, you know, you've won nothing here. Okay, and this is actually a bit of a problem. And, and when I started to understand this, I got a little bit depressed and I thought, well, fuck, picked the wrong project here. And I talked with my Google friend and he depressed me even more. And then, well, that's bad. And then, um, and then there's actually a paper um, that, that claims we can use zero knowledge proofs um, to, to somehow the idea would be that if I receive a token, the sender also sends me a proof that, um, 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 you know, that this is a valid token. Okay, and so, I mean, the, the paper was, you know, a little bit light on detail, so I, I don't, I'm not sure I can verify that. And, and also, you know, man, zero knowledge proofs, I wanted to launch something soon, now I have to learn about zero knowledge proofs, that seems tons of work, so I wanted to look for, you know, something more practical. And, okay, so, so what I'm just thinking, you know, JavaScript, you know, you can write programs in JavaScript that don't terminate, you know, worst, worst, you know, worst case behavior of JavaScript is infinite, yes, please. The previous slide. Uh, yeah. Are each and every one of those transactions running off of a different contract, or...? Um, no, each, each of these transactions is, is um, sort of one transfer in the same contract. 
right? I think of the ERC20 token. There's like a, you know, a bunch of tokens. They're all sort of stored in the unspent outputs here. And when you own one of these unspent outputs, you can send it to someone else by building a transaction and, and sending it to, to someone else. So um, what is the difference between the way you're, uh, you're looking at this versus what's um, um, well, so, yeah, so the big difference between this and Ethereum is in Ethereum, the miners take care of all this, okay? So all the smart contracts are sort of evaluated by, by every miner and you as a user don't have to do anything, okay? If it's, an, if it's on the blockchain in Ethereum, you're secure that, you know, miners have checked that this is a valid token. But since miners are not aware of these tokens in, in Bitcoin and these standards all sort of work around, you know, Bitcoin a little bit, um, you have to check it yourself, okay? So it's a great question. I will actually talk about the same point in, in a bit as well. Okay. Okay. So we can get unlucky, but um, okay. So 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 let's let's see. So maybe like, just like in JavaScript, you know, worst case performance is, is really bad, but still JavaScript is a very useful tool, right? And just just because like you know, many, there's many many you know interesting relevant use cases that can be sort of solved efficiently with JavaScript. Okay. Even if if you can't solve everything, worst case, not so bad. So I, I this is just my thought process. I, let's just think of like you know you know, important use cases for tokens, okay? And just the, the, the simplest and most important use case I can think of is just like streaming, okay? So Alice buys their Wi-Fi from Bob, she pays with tokens and sends him token like one directional every 10 minutes, just token, token, just in one direction, okay? That's pretty much the simplest thing I can imagine. Okay, so how, how, would, how would this work with everything exactly like I explained before plus this memorization, okay? So Alice owns 10, 10 tokens here and, and, you know, Alice has already verified, let's say. Okay, and now um, Alice sends one token to Bob. Okay, so Alice broadcasts this transaction here with two outputs saying that Bob now has one token and Alice has nine tokens now. Okay, and the operator is there to store everything. And since Alice broadcasts it and she, she trusts herself, she just puts this in her database immediately. Okay, and then Bob comes along and finds this transaction on the blockchain and, you know, does the usual, usual game. Okay, so he goes back to the issuance transaction, verifies everything is valid, Okay, and then like top down, he starts, you know, adding this guy to his, his database and in the next step he adds like this, this current transaction to the database, okay? Then Alice sends the, the, the second token to Bob, okay? And now, you know, Alice puts it into her database immediately. Bob now, now finds that, that output and um, you know, traces back, but, but due to the fact that it's just streaming just one direction, he had already sort of um, just seen this, this, uh, this sort of previous transaction and he just sort of has to hit the database like in constant time again and, and you know, can accept this, this transfer immediately, okay? All that she has to do is, um, you know, sort of parse this, this one transaction and, and her, hit her database one time, okay? So that's like an extremely efficient way to do, um, you know, to send tokens in one direction, okay? And they can, can keep doing this, you know, for a long time, okay? So now it's a little bit less depressing. At least we found one use case that we can find, you know, uh, we can do efficiently. Okay, but maybe it get, gets better. Let's look at diff, uh, other use cases, okay? Another sort of, sort of very, very simple use case would be, uh, I call it the ping pong use case, maybe it's the casino use case, I don't know, where you just, two guys just send a token back and forth all the time. Okay, this is a bit silly, but wait and see, okay? So, so okay, so can we do ping pong use case efficiently is the question. So how, how does it work? Um, okay, so Alice first has 20 tokens, then Bob, um, Alice sends 10 tokens to Bob, Alice now has 10, um, 10 tokens, okay? So Alice just sends something to Bob, now Bob um, finds this, stores the stuff in, in his database, and sends a token to Alice, okay? And I made a little mistake here, this should be one, but who cares? Um, and, okay, so, so Bob sends, you know, one, one transaction back to, to Alice, Bob puts this into his database because he trusts himself, and um, now, now Alice sort of has to verify, but again, we see the same, same behavior like before, Alice already has all the upstream transactions in, in her database, okay? And so we can, we can go on if we now sort of, Alice sends a token back to Bob, Alice trusts herself, Bob already has the sort of the upstream transaction in the data, database, so the ping pong use case we can do efficiently as well, okay? That's better. So, so let's see, so what, what about sort of combinations of, of ping pong and streaming, okay? So let's say these guys do streaming, you know, rounds, okay? So here Alice has sent two tokens to Bob. Bob now has two unspent outputs with one. Alice, um, Alice has eight tokens. And now, now say they want to re reverse, sort of switch to ping pong mode, where now, now Bob sends something to Alice. And say Bob wants to send two, two, um, two transactions to, to Alice. You know, what she does, 
is he just builds the obvious transaction, spending sort of these outputs, you know, from the stream to Alice. And, you know, when Alice finds this, again, we have a property where all these sort of upstream transactions are already in, in, in Alice's database, okay? So what this tells us is that, like, any combination of, of, of streaming and ping pong can be done in, in you know, constant time to, to receive the token, which is awesome. And, um, and in, in fact, actually, if you think of it, every single token exchange that just involves two parties is like some combination of ping pong and, and streaming, okay? So, so what this kind of shows, if you're like a little bit careful with how you build your transactions, um, you can actually do all protocols between two people, you know, very efficiently, okay? And so, so how does this help us build, you know, services on top of Bitcoin? Okay, so if you're, you know, if you're operating a service, you know, you're, you're one of these, you know, one of these hubs here and you have users, and what, what you need to maintain is, you know, pretty much one TXID for each of your users, okay? And since all these TXIDs are like so, so small, you can fit like 31 million of them into one gigabyte, okay? So you can, you can operate a service with, you know, where you, you know, you, know you, have, you have 31 million users, you know, with just one, one gigabyte, okay? You can afford more than one gigabyte this day. So this, this scales, like way more than the underlying blockchain, okay? So, so this isn't like the bottleneck anymore. And if you don't like centralized stuff, you know, de decentralized version of the same way, okay? Now, now all the users, of course, also, have to, like in, the, in, the, in this previous picture here, so, you know, these centralized nodes need to maintain like, I don't know how many there are, seven, um, you know, seven streams, and each of the users just has one stream, and this guy there has two streams, okay? But then if you want to do the decentralized version of this, you know, now all the users have like more, you know, have to store more than just one TXID, but still, sort of, they can join sort of some sort of decentralized social network. There's 31 million, 31 million people that they send tokens back and forth with, okay, just in one gigabyte, okay, and, and nobody sends tokens to 31 million people, okay. So, so this is this is something that can be done extremely efficiently. So, okay. So, what does this? And this also comes back to I think your previous question. So what, what are sort of the implications for scalability? Okay, so, so like mentioned, like the, the, the big difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum is that like in Ethereum, the miners um, check all the smart contracts. Okay, so, so that's cool for the user because they don't have to validate anything. But it also, of course, you know, on the other hand, like all the miners have to validate all smart contracts. Okay, whereas sort of in, in, in Bitcoin, if we do it like in this way, you know, Bitcoin only is sort of this, this hyper-efficient minimal thing that just sort of provides distributed consensus, okay? And, and sort of the smart contracts are sort of built around this a little bit, just sort of making minimal use of this distributed consensus, okay? And, and the, the nice thing here is that like these smart contracts are only evaluated by the parties involved, okay? So I can write a smart contract where accepting a token is an NP-complete problem, right? Where you need a supercomputer to accept this token. Okay, but if everybody, you know, who's in that token is interested in the same thing, that's going to work for these people, and nobody else has to care. Okay, if you wanted to do this in, in Ethereum, it'd be like insanely expensive, and people would start, you know, you know, complaining about like social costs and stuff like this. Okay, where you know maybe some rich guy can afford to run these super complicated smart contracts, but then you know, kind of nobody else can use Ethereum in that time. That kind of sucks. So I think this 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 sort of hybrid approach. Where sort of, you know, you just use Bitcoin to sort of for this distributed consensus and build stuff around it might actually be a path that, you know, might make Bitcoin scale much better and at the same time support, you know, more complicated applications than Ethereum, okay? And, you know, this advantage is, you know, you have to look out for, for your own good, okay? That's, that's, in my opinion, how the world, you know, should work. Okay, so that, that was my simple token standard. Um, it's selling point is, you know, it's simple, expressive, and scal scalable. It's the first contract that sort of breaks out of this problem of the trade-off between simplicity and expressivity, and it's also extremely scalable, and it's also implemented in JavaScript, so it's, you know, it can run client-side, you can build non-custodial applications with any sort of mostly legal and regulatory advantages, and um, yeah, that's what it is. And now the demo, which is highly entertaining to you, for the same reason as horrible for me, because there's like the possibility for Embarrassment in the internet, but um, I think I should be fine. Yeah, yeah, it's cool for you, but yeah. No, actually, my code is actually relatively stable now, so it should, it should work. Okay, let's see here. Okay, so, okay. So, uh, was there a question? No? Okay. All right, let's see here. So, we have, um, okay, what I have running here. So, I have running a, um, a message server. So since I'm using non-standard contracts, I have to use a P2SH, and you can't just look at the blockchain and, and you know, figure out that that's a, um, <coughs> you know, that's a to token that's 
that's relevant to you. And so instead, I'm, I'm using sort of a separate server just as a messaging server that when, when I send you a token, I also like send you this message, okay, here's, you know, here's your token transaction and here's sort of the pre-image to the P2SH hash. Okay, so the way P2SH works, it doesn't store the actual scripts in the blockchain, just the, just the hashes of the scripts. Okay, and so, so, so this is my, my sort of my message ser server here, but if you're concerned about running a server, you know, you can replace this by, it is just a messaging system, okay? You can replace it by a decentralized messaging system if you like. And also, if you really don't like it, you know, lobby for allowing non-standard scripts because it's gonna make Bitcoin much, much better. Um, okay, let's see here. So we got our trusted server running. We're gonna wipe the database just for good measure. Okay, and now, of course, I don't do this by heart. I have a little script here. Let's see, okay, we, we run node just with this command line flag that allows me to use, a, you know, a wait. Okay, here we go. Okay, now we just sort of create a new token object. Okay, returns undefined, that's okay. We, we're gonna need a, a you know, Bitcoin implementation. I'm using Bitcoin lib or a version of Bitcoin lib. Um, we need a private key to initialize the, um, uh, did this happen? No, not, okay, because I didn't copy it. Oh, no, no. Okay, has already been declared. Okay, that's just me being stupid. Okay, so we now have a private key that we're gonna need to sort of initialize this token, and we're gonna need these test keys just for technical reasons. I mean, all this is gonna be much nicer. I've, I've not spent time massaging the code for this presentation. Okay, okay, now we wanna issue a token. What we just do is we create a new token object. Okay, and um, we set the private key to um, this, this is just some, Thing it, it, it just all that, that this does it just sets sets the, the private key property in the, in the token object. Okay, and, and now now we can go ahead and define our token. So we're going to say token one dot total supply. Um, okay, well, how how much supply do you guys want? A hundred. All right. Come on, make up your minds, people here. No, we're going to do a hundred because that's easier to keep track of. Okay, we're going to set so let's apply the thing, and, and we're just gonna call, call init. That doesn't do much yet. That it just sort of initializes the, the wallet with a private key that we plugged in there previously, and you know, this, this sort of thing. But now, now we can do actual interesting stuff, and we can create the token, okay? And what this guy here does is it actually creates the, um, the, uh, uh, the token issuance transaction, okay? And it returns this, this key here, where now we can go to block cipher, uh, whatever it is, block trail and see that like this is an actual transaction. Okay, it's unconfirmed, I just broadcast it right now. And you see, so you always have to have like these, these extra inputs that just pay sort of minimal Satoshi amounts, but then you have like this, this, this guy here, this P2SH address, which is sort of the, the token issuance transaction. Okay, and it's got encoded there how many, how many tokens there are. Okay, and so at this point, I can, uh, I can already, I guess, check the balance of this token. Okay, okay, because that, that's supposed to happen because I haven't defined public key one yet. Let's define public key one. Okay, now I can do the same thing. I can get the balance and I see that it's actually 100 things. And, and so this, this get balance function does the actual shebang of you know, looking up all options transactions and stuff like this. Okay, so the, 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 my, my implementation is actually not, it's not that far away from being production ready. And mostly what I'm not doing now is like this fancy thing with storing smart contracts in the blockchain. Currently, I just have hard-coded an ERC-20 token and I'll have to rip out like this, find the piece of code to rip out that you guys will, will be able to store on the blockchain later. Okay, but other than that, it's, it's actually in pretty good shape. Okay, now we want to send this token somewhere. So we create a new user and currently it's also a token object. This will all be cleaned up. Um, and again, we have to set a sort of, to initialize the wallet, we have to, um, add this private key in here, and like this output, this is not my fault, I think this is Bitcore or something. Okay, and, and, and we, we initialize token number two. Okay, and we have to like get the public key of token number two, okay? Because to send stuff, we need uh, a public key. Okay, so now we have balance. Token one get balance was 100. Token two balance, and again, zero. Okay, let's send something. How, ma how many tokens should we send here? Uh, why do you do this? Okay, let's first try, okay, I just sent one by mistake, but um, let's see if this, this worked. Here's the balance thing, and up there. 
k token one now should have 99 tokens, all right? And token number two should have one token. Okay, let's try this minus four thing, which I never tried, and it's probably not a good idea, but let's see if it flows, ah, I'm sorry. Wait. Uh, okay, minus four public key two. Okay, I shouldn't be doing this, but okay. Okay, string must be, okay, so there's an error, that's good. Okay, but let's try something, something else that's bad. <laughs> what? Yeah, I need like, if something goes, goes wrong with the hex encoding. I'm storing everything in hex encoder. Um, I don't think it's gonna be that easy. Uh, you just go on and keep torturing me here. So how, how, how do you do this? O, X or shit? Or you know, just, okay. Yeah, I've been hanging around here for about four years. Uh, no, it has to be good. Yeah, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. Yeah, it, it has to be an integer. What my code does is like parse an integer into an hex and probably it just can't parse minus, minus four into hex. I don't know what the problem is, but you're not supposed to do that anyway, okay? So, but let's do something else that's mean and, and you're able to do this. Let's send, you know, token one has 99 tokens still, I think. So let's send, you know, 100 tokens to public key two and syntax errors. Okay, yeah. All right, okay, now we get insufficient token funds. So, so, so that, that stuff already kind of works. Okay, so we, we got basic functionality here, but there's you know, still more work on, you know, until I can like, you know, launch this for real money, but it's, it's not that far away. And you can help, okay? So that, that didn't went too bad. All right, lost the thing. Okay, so, okay, I'm now on a new mission. My mission used to be getting paid the work you do online. My new mission now is understanding computation in, in Bitcoin, which to me is absolutely fascinating. To me, the, the, the difference, maybe the way I see Bitcoin differently, I see Bitcoin as a programming language, okay? And just, just a means to do computations. And I want to understand how this works, and this is super exciting to me. And if you want to help me, you know, join me, number one. I haven't raised funds yet, so if you're an investor, you know, get in early. You're going to get very, very rich if you invest in me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, well, if you're, if you're an intern, well, let me do my plugs and I'll, I'll go in a second, okay. Um, if you're an intern, you want to intern with me and you're a great computer science student, you know, hit me up, that's my email, and, and come do an unpaid internship with me until I raise funds. If you're a, you know, world-class programmer, also, you know, just get in touch. I hope I'm going to have funding soon and I want to build the best team in Bitcoin, okay? So I'm talking with all my, you know, smartest buddies from, from before. I'm going to have an amazing team. If you want to work, you know, with a great team on an exciting project in Bitcoin, get in touch. And um, if you want to help me with open source development, you can do that too. There is, there is this project called Bitcoin Cash Flow. So, so the thing is that like JavaScript Bitcoin implementations are in really bad shape, okay? Like Bitcore uses, you know, all this prototype inheritance and stuff. I'm, I'm afraid even to change things because like coded so weirdly. So I'm, I'm sort of launching this community project called um, Bitcoin Cash Flow. And so if the goal is just to, don't change anything, just get a clean impl implementation of, of, of JavaScript Bitcoin going, okay? And so, so like step one will be, you know, introduce modern JavaScript, you know, no more prototypical inheritance. Step two, you know, make it sort of compliant with, you know, some very strict linter, okay? Because I'm, I'm actually quite a fan of linters now. And then the reason it's called cash, you know, Bitcoin cash flow, is because eventually it's supposed, supposed to be statically type check in, in, in with, you know, with, with Facebook's flow. Because I think it's insane that we're, we're, we have like billions of dollars resting on, on code that looks horrible if you look at it, okay? And so you can all please help me. It's, it's, it's the, the easiest way if you want to get into Bitcoin, you want to work on the actual Bitcoin code, that's, that's a very good, good way to get your sort of your, your, your feet wet. Because all you have to do is be really good at JavaScript and just turning horrible JavaScript into night JavaScript and you will learn how Bitcoin works on the way. Okay, I'm sorry. And I'll come back to you. Thank you very much. Okay, I think he, he was actually first enough. So I feel like a little bit like you felt given it down, but this might be a dumb question. If the, if the miners aren't understanding these outputs, what prevents a double spend? Um, the, the recipient, it's the responsibility of, of the recipient of the token to make sure it's not a double spend. Okay, so double spends can happen and if should, you know, should one of them succeed? Like if I, if I, if I sent, you know, yeah, well, not in this case. In this case, like the person who cheats just sort of burns his coins. And that's nothing that I invented. I think all of these coins 
you know, can't things. I, can't I make it a double spend much later after the fact? Yeah. No, no, because like if you know, if, if a valid valid transfer gets you know sort of committed to the blockchain, you know, you can't, you can't, you'd have to sort of spend. You'd have to do a Bitcoin double spend. Well, you could do a Bitcoin double spend if you want to. Yeah. But then you know, I'm just going to you know miners take care of that. Okay. So you, just like in Bitcoin, you can do a Bitcoin double spend. But but the, the token double spend, you know, the the recipient. Could do that. I guess I'm still not. I'm still not. I'll talk to you after. Okay. So quick question on the JavaScript. Uh, so, uh, were you saying that the, the current JavaScript wrapper for Bitcoin is in a pretty terrible shape? The, the, well, I, okay. So I think the best JavaScript Bitcoin implementation I could find, and you know, from what I could tell, was Bitcore. Okay. So I don't want to like say that Bitcoin's Bitcore is bad because it's great and I love it and I use it all the time. I'm just saying, you know, it needs to be updated. Now. So I'm saying the jobs that Bitcore is in bad shape. So the question that I would have is, why don't we take the C++ implementation of, of Bitcore and just use WebAssembly, have one code, and then we just work on the build script so that you're instead of duplicating twice? Um, so first of all, I, I would love for this to happen, and you know, I, I would even gladly that that'd be awesome if we did it. Um, so for my so what, what, what sort of the way my architecture use, works right now, I sort of have this JavaScript implementation of, of, of Bitcore, and on top of this, I have my simple token standard thing. And sometimes I need to like change the depth things in the JavaScript a little bit. For me, it'd be easier to be able to just change the JavaScript thing because if we do it like your way, I'd have to change, you know, the C++ implementation and recompile it, which would work too. So I, I think either way would be a good way to do it. We just need like we just need a better, more reliable JavaScript implementation of Bitcore. And you know, you're proposing a very good way to do it, and the other way it would just be to clean it up. Um, so the transaction fees, it sounds like that would all have to come from the initial issuance or over a, a token definition of transaction and then spent up from there. Is there a good way of that, like, injecting more transaction fees? Yeah, so well, so it depends on how smart you are in, in writing sort of, sort of you as the user gets to decide what's a valid transfer transaction. Okay? And I would recommend that transfer transactions may have like one non-token carrying input, you know, with an arbitrary number of support. So that, that's how you put one thing. Okay, but it's it's not up to me to decide. It's up to the program to decide. But have you given much thought to how um, it might work in two different tokens, one transaction? I'm exchanging some number of red tokens for a number of blue tokens. How validation might have to work in that kind of scenario, making sure that both wallets uh, that the wallets agree that that. These are two different standards, right? Yeah. And so you could have quite a complexity coming from Well, what you, what you actually could do, just because like the token standard is so general. So say there's like two existing token solutions even more, like mix, mix the two together. I can write now the third token standard that says like everything, all the red you know, tokens are valid, all the green tokens are valid. And I'm in addition also going to allow ones that like mix, you know, mix the two in, in one transaction. Okay, so you could like build Sort of a higher level, you know, token that that just sort of makes these two tokens involved. So there's some simplification that, that can occur because otherwise you're going to have to validate all of blue tokens to exchange them with the red tokens, even though the red chain is really short. Yeah. So you would have to like essentially um, sort of encode the purple tokens, and they would validate both red tokens and the blue tokens. But it's, it's it's a great question. I've never thought about this, but you can immediately do it in the you know open tokens. Okay, so this thing of you know, the transfer definition is just a function of inputs, the transaction outputs a boolean is so general that you can cover like in one. Okay, sorry. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so one comment and question. First, if you're looking for a good JavaScript implementation, I want to plug uh, Bitcoin and Bcash. I love yeah. Bcoin. Okay, so Bcoin is actually the exception. Bcoin is beautiful. Okay, and it's like, you know, it, it's beautiful. I don't think it's tech but other than that, I, I'd be happy to use it. It's just, okay, and okay, I, I was just used to using Bitcore as well from my previous job at yours, so I, I kind of gravitated towards that. But, you know, Bitcoin is beautiful. And, uh, yeah. It uses ES6, 7, and 8. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, that. The type of inheritance yeah. isn't the way that yeah. you can run a uh, phone and browser and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's cool. I should look more into, into Bitcoin, actually. I always say that. One day I will do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so I, I was kind of hoping we, I could, we could see the class for that token, because that's where all the magic is happening, right? <laughs> in, uh, in the demo. 
Yeah, my highly proprietary source code. Uh, uh, I don't. I, unfortunately, I, I don't. I don't want to do that right now. Um, so I, I guess then my question is: so that's if you're issuing this token, what's actually is anybody that wants to use that token has to have that file on their local database, or whatever that might be. Yeah. And uh, you know the, the way it's going to work is they're going to find that on the blockchain, which is like always there, and you know just sort of plug it into the, the JavaScript code that's that's running on there. So they're going to have to download the reference implementation of the Open Token Standard, you know, find that one little missing piece there on the blockchain, plug it into that that, that um, reference implementation. That's it. Um, is there any sort of uh, thoughts about I don't know, like a Decentralizing the distribution of that standard so you can kind of like discover tokens through some sort of like peer to peer sharing rather than kind of like downloading it from somewhere. Um, so I, 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 I'm just wondering like, if, if, there's, if there's any ways that you're thinking of, because now it seems like the, the difficulty is actually like right now, you, like anybody can discover uh, like Bitcoin transaction, right? Like yeah. the protocol, that's basically what's in the peer to peer network with Bitcoin protocol. I'm wondering if there's any thoughts to like, how would you, how would, is there a good way to like, just get, like they have, they have contract explorers in you know, Ethereum, right? Because it's all on the block. Yeah. If there was a way to maybe um, have contract explorers uh, for this, some sort of peer to peer distribution of those contracts of that, that index file. Yeah, yeah. So th that's totally something that, you know, can be built and should be built. And there's actually like an insane amount of stuff that, you know, could and should be built on top of that, right? So just like you say, like a good explorer, an exchange, you know, you know, just a nice website to issue this contract. So there's lots of stuff that, that you know needs to be built, and I can't build it all by myself. So I'd be very happy to get like, help, and I'm I'm still kind of determining how exactly I'm going to structure this. But but certainly, I you know I would like people to, to help me build this stuff together because there's lots of beautiful stuff to be built, and I, I can't do it by myself. Even if I raise money, I can't do it by myself. I'd be extremely happy if people want to just help me. You know, if if they just leave in this mission, then it's interesting to understand the computation. Be fine. Now let's work together and make Bitcoin you know, awesome. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah you were. So, if I understand correctly, you're going to take a JavaScript implementation of full node, mm -hmm. publish scripts on the blockchain, you're going to load those scripts, and you're going to run them, and they're going to have some library routines that they use to find nodes, to find UTXOs, to But it's like, look, you're, you're downloading, you know, code from the blockchain. Okay, you're, you're downloading code every single day, all the time, every time you use the internet, right? Every single, you know, website has script tags. You're downloading stuff, and you're not even so. Actually, my version is a little bit more secure. You're downloading from the blockchain, and you know that code will never change. So if you have, you know, your, you know, someone sort of verify that this is, you know, a, a good smart contract, you can actually rely on that being there and always being good code. Okay? But but nothing like this system doesn't prevent people from writing, you know, you know, bad smart contracts. And that's just something that comes with the generality of it, right? You can in any high level programming language, you can write, you know, bad malicious code. Right? But if you want to like do, do something very general, you know, you have to sort of allow for the malicious stuff to get the good stuff. Well, I mean a Bitcoin script or an Ethereum script is it's sandboxed, right? Yeah. And, and I think of like an example would be like Java Applets, which is a problem with but the idea was you have a job security manager that lets things run, but they, there's, there's, a, you know, there's a boundary between the context of the application script and the system. And are you, you're not finding that implementing something? Well, like so, so it is automatically, so it's all JavaScript implemented. And so, so if it runs in a web browser, it's like automatically sent box by, by the web browser, right? Like code in the web browser can't access your over high life. So, so whenever you run stuff in, in, in your web browser, like the average user is going to be protected by that sandbox. But then if, if you run this like in, in your, on your service, you, know, you have to look up to the but, but I mean, like one, one uh, smart contract could possibly interfere with another or with the operation of the node itself because they're running in the context of that node implementation, right? 
Um, okay, so this is the question of sandboxing. Like, so I have, like, say, a token wallet, and I'm using three different tokens, and you're worried about like one token messing with the other token. Yeah. So of course, my prototype is nothing like that. That's also one of the things that, that you know, should be worried about. Yeah. Good point. So you have plans to address that. Yeah. Yeah. What is a phone wallet maker got to do support the tokens? A phone wallet maker. Um, so yeah, well, they, well, they can just use my software. Okay, it's going to be like licensing needs to be figured out, but it's just going to be like an NPM package. You plug it into your code, and it's going to be exactly the stuff that I did here in the demo. It's going to be extremely easy to use. Okay, so actually, on my my badly word website, um, um, BitcoinToken.com, you can you can see how easy it's going to be to to integrate this just to use my software. So if you want to issue a new token. You know, like out of out of some 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 app or whatever, you just run a couple of lines of JavaScript code, and you can issue it out there. So, so trying to like get all the complexity in, inside of my NPM package, provide this very very nice clean interface that's going to make it very very easy to use. And then let's say a user receives an error drop, so a token that they don't know they're going to be receiving. Is there anything that they need to do, or, or is it like the clinic on the cache is responsible to recognize that token for sure? Um, well, I'm, I'm just going to have to say this is all stuff that needs to be worked out. Yeah, so, so I'm currently just working on sort of the, the, the base protocol, and like as soon as you start building more stuff, there's going to be like more issues popping up, and there's like tons of stuff that needs to be taken care of. And I, I also like you raise things that I will not, you know, come up with. So I, I would really like to have like a community of people tell me, you know, what I'm, what I'm missing out. Blockchain, like Ethereum, there is the, the miners are the ones who run the, the, the calculation. So there is a, an immutable state on the blockchain of all the storage and whatever the monitor is called. In this case, it's not, of course, on the blockchain. So it basically relies on the fact that this, the implementation is correct and synchronous across all the codes, right? But if, some, if there are some bugs or changes the big versions or anything that causes the computation, one place to be different than another, you, you don't currently have a protection against that, right? Um, yes, that's true, but I also think the situation is just like when you when you use you know any any Bitcoin implementation, right? So first of all, the difference is like just like in Bitcoin and its tokens, the entire state is stored on the blockchain, and it's just like the you know sort of the computation. You know, there can be different implementations for using. But here, you, the entire state is not stored on the blockchain. You don't have really an immutable state of all the stuff that you let to a smart contract, right? There's no minor setting like the irrevocable history of the world after six information. It's stored in theory, like you could even introduce updates to an implementation, and in theory they could even introduce new subtle bugs or changes to stuff that was already stored. Yeah. So, so you, you're saying the problem is that like my approach, you can't update the smart contract. Is, 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 that, is that the question? No, more, more, I'm just uh, trying to understand if there is uh, something inherent now in the future that would provide the sort of immutability that one would want or expect in a smart contract or something, right? Because you want, like we use Ethereum, something similar, you have the immutability of the blockchain to back you up for whatever it was the case. It was a bad thing, right? But here you basically rely on the definition across all nodes to produce consistent results now and in the future, as versions update as bugs can potentially be introduced, there can be slight variations in different places. And it introduced like it could be slight bugs or like a very very strange issue, including of course room for attacks and things I'm just trying to understand it. Yeah. So I mean, we, we, should, we should talk later as well because I, I, I might not understand entirely correctly, but sort of the way it works like the smart contract is stored immutable on, on the blockchain. Okay, but then you have sort of the sort of the, the reference client, which is not at all stored on a blockchain. Okay, that's just software. And that can be buggy, and it's bad if it's buggy, and I have to better watch out that it's not buggy. But I, if I understand it correctly, I think the situation is the same in Bitcoin. Okay? So you can use a Bitcoin implementation that has a bug and you're gonna lose your money or something like this, right? You know, you click I wanna send, you know, one one you know, ten cents to someone, Bitcoin implementation sends ten Bitcoin. You know, if the, the implementation has a bug, there, there's even if there is a bug, there would be one state on the blockchain. Like if if your Bitcoin implementation is buggy, and you send it to one address and you put in another address and send it to your money there, it's gonna it's gonna be an immutable history of the blockchain, still gonna be a meet upon everyone. 
even if it was a bug. Yes. It's not true with Bitcoin. You, you can have a bug that introduces a fork. And if one, the buggy implementation and the non-buggy implementation will have different balances, right? Yeah, but, but still you will have an immutable state of the blockchain. But now you have, two, now you blockchain. have two immutable states, right? Right. So he, he has the same issue, but it's... I, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm from Omni Foundation, so I've dealt with some of these issues. Okay. Um, it's so, so you don't you don't have uh, you don't have consensus enforced, but you do you you can have multiple implementations that right, but that, you, that, that have different balances. Well, not exactly because when, when a fork happens, clearly you know that a fork has happened. If you have an <coughs> engine across or engines like smartphone engines across how this nodes, they may be either flight variations, different implementations, and some of them produce slightly different results. Maybe it's a result even of an attack or whatever. You, you don't have a way to know that. There's no fork in the chain. There's no immutable state to look at it and see, oh, look, this is wrong. There's nothing like that. No, no, no so, so state is, is immutable because it's all in UTXOs. Yeah, all the, so all the it's token. Just, it's just the calculations that you run uh, on top of that that yeah. can get different values. But every, everything that has ever happened, every token transfer, even if it's a wrong token transfer, everything's always on chain and like stored there immutably. So if there's a bug in one implementation, it's going to you know broadcast these bad transactions that all send to the wrong address or the wrong amount or whatever. You know that might happen, but it's going to be recorded on the blockchain. Just if you use a buggy Bitcoin implementation that you know sort of builds the wrong transactions, it's also you know going to do the wrong thing, but it's going to be like stored on the blockchain. Okay, I don't, I don't want to hijack the discussion. I think, think this one. Yeah, I don't have a different day to the talk. I just wondering, so is this, my understanding, is this another proposal of uh, different uh, tokens on the Bitcoin? Yep. So how does this uh, differ from other kind of proposals, like, uh, like one proposal based on Omni, or like Cardcoin, or what are the proposals and comments, but it's, it's all less? It's it's just way better. <laughs> no, 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 okay. So, so, so I mean, okay, let's see here. So, we'll talk. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. succinctly. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, the, 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 the difference is that, like, my standard is very, very simple, and in that it's like easy to understand, easy to implement, but at the same time, it's extremely expressive. Okay. You can create potentially all possible smart contracts in the state, whereas sort of existing implementations are very, very complicated. Um, very long, hard to read, and only cover like a handful of use cases. My standard is very, very simple, it covers all use cases pretty much. So it is much more as I, as I understand it, one, you're using JavaScript for the contract language, and two, you're moving the, uh, the, 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 the definitions in the UTXO fields instead of the OP return. Yeah, so I'm, and what, I'm, what I'm kind of doing is I'm moving the definition of what's a valid transfer from the standards document, sort of first step into code, and second step I'm storing that code on the blockchain. That's the difference. And then how is it getting stored on the blockchain? That's the part I missed. Yeah, it's just like in just, just in an output, just in plain text. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So, so why, then there's a limit in the number of characters you can have in your... Yeah, and like as a result, it's just the block size. And then all you just do is just come up with some way of linking to another contract. Okay, so once someone has you know, you know stored their ERC20 token, you know, in some output, you'll be able to just say, okay, just a link. I mean, this contract. So we just add links there, and then that takes care of it. Okay. So the the unspent uh, transactions are checked at the um, at the end, or it seems like what you're doing uh, when a double spend occurs. Could potentially send uh, the same amount of coin coins twice, or tokens twice, um, but the verification will not happen on uh, on the blockchain. Yeah. So if a double spend occurs, probably what could happen is that like you know a transfer switches from being valid to invalid. Okay. So maybe I. So you're talking about like a normal Bitcoin double spend, right? Uh, uh, token. Token double spend. Well, token double spends, you know, they can happen, and they will be recorded on the blockchain, and everybody will be able to check if this was an actual like double spend, and 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 not not accept these tokens. This is nothing that I invented. This is something that that's been there in, in the. Okay. Uh, 
So one important thing is I'm, I'm not, not inventing any new sort of security model here, okay? I'm choosing exactly the security model of color coins that has been battle tested to $2.5 billion valuation. Okay, all that I'm doing is I'm using it slightly and sort of exploiting it a little bit more. And, and this is where I get my exposure. I want to transfer the data model because I took and obey the rules in JavaScript. How would that work? Well, if your, if your token standard permits that, you know, maybe, I mean, that's, that's a very good use case. This is how you trade tokens, right? This is like, I send you a token, the same transaction, you send me money. And you just, you, if, if sort of the, uh, the, sort of this little JavaScript file that's provided by the token issuer supports that, then you, yeah, then you can do that. Yeah, you, you, you can define a token standard that like, has no data at all, that just says you can only send even amounts of Bitcoin. Okay, whatever. We have time for one more question. Okay. So here you're doing on-chain transactions for everything. I'm sorry? Here um, in this model you're doing on-chain transactions for everything. Yeah. But as you know, transactions with tokens on Ethereum are cheaper, so there's a lot of activity there, and Bitcoin is trying to make the network, etc. to minimize these on-chain transactions. So do you see this model adapting to a like model in some form? Um, okay, so currently, as for the price point, I'm current. I'm, I'm just as concerned about the price as, as you are, and that's why I'm targeting Bitcoin Cash. Okay, so the few investors that I pitched this to, I was like, I can do everything in Ethereum just a hundred times cheaper. Okay, because I can do it on Bitcoin Cash. That kind of resonates. If I were to do a suit on Bitcoin, I can do everything we can do in Ethereum just a hundred times more expensive. You know, it's hard to get funding that way. Okay, so but but then you know, there are all sorts of tech can be built there. Okay, and then you know. Again, an interesting question. So I really think there's like an infinite amount of like almost research that can be done in, in this field and you know, can be adapted to, to whatever. Let's give Clement another round of applause.